one. Okay. So I'm okay without the microphone, right? You guys can hear? So far. Okay. So I'll turn it off and if I need it, then we'll grab it. Okay. Okay. So we'll start with just kind of, well, two key basics and then fill in some details. Okay. Cause there's a lot more than two things you need to know. Right. But I feel like most people miss two main things. Yes. Oh, Mindy, Mindy Mortensen. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. So I'm a botanist. Um, I've been teaching classes for, I don't know, 20 years, probably something I do consulting. So the two main things we're going to start with. Normally I pass stuff around, but I'm going to just show you and tell you. Okay. I'm a very visual learner, so I have to like have it and touch it and see it. So I'm sorry, but we'll do our best. Okay. Soil is our number one thing we're going to start with. Soil, soil, soil. I don't say enough about soil. You'll get tired of it, but here's the deal. Whatever you can do for your Utah soils, you should. We have very little organic matter. We have a high pH. Nutrients become unavailable just not because they're not there. They're there, but they become unavailable because the plants can't take them up in the pH level that they're at and our water has kind of a high pH. So if you can be adding organic matter all the time, be adding organic matter. So your landscape stuff, you know, you put in this little garden, let's say you helped your soil in the beginning and planted your plants. That's probably about all you're going to do, right? Unless you wanted to come and mix compost in a little bit every year or something. But vegetable garden, which is what we're focusing on, you should be doing a lot every year because you're going to eat that, right? And you want those nutrients to be there. So everything you can do is great. Okay. I guess there's a few things I wouldn't recommend, but, um, any kind of compost is awesome. Whether you make it yourself, whether you have your own little worm farm, whether you just buy a bag of compost from Willard Bay gardens, of course, anything is going to help. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Grass clippings is good to an extent. Um, it's going to be almost pure nitrogen. And so you've got to offset that and have some, some of the other. Just have people call me all the time and they're like, I have tomatoes that are this as tall as me, tomato plants with no tomatoes. And I always say, do you put grass clippings in your garden? And they're like, yeah, all the time, every week. That's why pure nitrogen and so all you're doing is encouraging growth, growth 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 not the fruit so here's what you can do to fix that okay so in my little bag here I'll spell it for you this is called azomite and it's a z o m I'm not saying you have to take notes but if you are a z o m i t e so why I love it is this um, it is has anyone ever used Redmond's real salt before yeah. Okay, and it's mined out of the earth. It's salts from ancient Lake Bonneville, right? Minerals, okay. This is the exact same kind of thing, only in the plant version. Okay, so it's mined in Utah, mined right out of the earth, um, ancient sea minerals, basically. Okay, so it has 60 trace nutrients in it. And so the way that, you know how your body, you need some things in bigger degree and some things in smaller. But sometimes those smaller things can limit what you uptake the bigger quantities of or the bigger nutrients. It's exactly the same with plants. So it's kind of like their vitamins. Okay. The big nutrients are in our soil and there, but sometimes they're limited by the little nutrients. And so if you can add those with azomite, um, then suddenly they can now access those bigger nutrients. So this is this and compost. And then the one other thing I'm going to show you is I don't fertilize, like I don't buy a chemical fertilizer at all. I just use this and compost. Okay. So it comes, not a ton. Um, it comes in like a, let's see, a 44 pound bag, which I think is so random, but true. And it's like 23 or $4 or something. That would probably be more than plenty for most of you. But the cool thing about it is you can use it on your lawn, your fruit trees, your landscape. You could use it anywhere. So most of us might only need 
a bag and we could do a lot of our area. I have a huge vegetable garden, so I use one bag every year just on my vegetable garden. Okay, so like this amount, um, I have like kind of raised beds. Um, they're like four feet by 25. I know they're large. I like to see people's face when I, and I have 19 of them, so yes, I'm a little crazy. But um, this would be enough for one of those beds about, if that kind of gives you an idea. Now it's not going to burn, I guess if you drop the whole bag or something it probably would, but it's not going to burn like a chemical fertilizer would. It's just like vitamins in that the plant will uptake what it needs and not what it doesn't. Does that make sense? So it's not going to be dangerous, okay? Um, but you can use it anywhere. So as a mite, it's a great, great addition. Okay, and then the other thing, hello. The other thing that I really recommend using, um, and this is just one brand or one way you can find it, but um, it's called mycorrhizae, okay? So it's a fungus that lives symbiotically with the root system of a plant, okay? So this brand is called Mycos. Um, and sometimes I can find it at nurseries, but lots of times I start early enough that I can't and I even just have to order it on Amazon. I'll spell mycorrhizae for you though, okay? Okay, it's M-Y-C-O, so myco, and then R-R-H-I-Z-A-E, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's just the name of a fungus that will live symbiotically with the plants. So the cool thing about it, now this is, my bag's gone, so you don't get to see it really, but eh, no. It's a, like a white powder. Think of powdered up mushrooms, basically, okay? Um, and it, it, you hardly use, it's like a, this little thing's like a teaspoon and a tablespoon, I think, yeah. So this, I would use at the time of planting, whether it's seeds or, you know, putting in a root ball, um, and just kind of sprinkle it in when you're planting, okay? And you don't use a ton. It's kind of pricey. This little bag is like $25, but because you're only using a tiny bit, it goes pretty long, okay? Um, not every single plant will make those connections, but most will. Some already kind of do naturally, like peas. You guys have heard about peas before being nitrogen fixers. Um, they already have a symbiotic relationship with fungus. That's how they do that, but... Um, but it won't hurt to add it to any plants. And then if it makes, you know, usually it will. So all it's going to do is expand your root system. And if your root system is expanded, then what's gonna be more available? The water, the nutrients, right? Everything that it needs. So that's really its only purpose, okay? So again, um, I do this just at the time of planting. Um, if you were wanted to try it and you've already got stuff in the ground, you could still go mix it around, okay? Or if you wanted to put, if you have a tree that is so struggling and you're like, what is wrong with this thing? You could try adding a little bit of this and some azomite, see what you can do, okay? Yes? Um, I guess if I'm putting it in when I'm planting, it's kind of getting worked in, but I'm not like consciously oh af if you were doing after yeah i would a little just to mix it around where you've planted yeah so any questions on either of those two these are like my if you're going to do at least anything for your soil at least do these this could be done at any time because i could come right here and come around and put it on these plants so this could be done anytime okay and then otherwise for your soil for sure compost um like i said whether you buy it whether you make it but the, what other soil additives have you guys wondered about or thought of, or I don't know. Sometimes people ask me about peat moss. Peat moss is great to hold moisture and to kind of mix in. It's not something that natively is in our soil at all. So I don't feel like it's super required. And we have, most of us have quite a bit of clay soil, okay? And so um, clay already holds moisture. So breaking up our clay is a, kind of a better thing we need, right? For that, I would use soil pep, which is a composted bark. Um, and it's not gonna add nutrients or anything, it just kinda adds those air spaces. Leaves. Leaves, leaves are organic matter. So yeah, sure, um, you know, if you wanna add that in the fall, some of you till, till those in later in the spring or whatever, or even at the time of putting them on, that'd be great. Whatever you can add to help your soil is awesome. 
you'll notice, so I've been doing um, kind of this raised bed garden system for, this is my seventh year. Before that, I just did more of the traditional, here's a big plot of land, till the whole thing, have rows, more like a traditional farmer, you know? Um, and I would add, orga you know, I would get some horse manure and whatever and add stuff. But what I've really noticed in this different way, just adding these things and my chicken manure, how much more amazing my soil is. We had to replace a water line um, to go into my garden. We've been digging a 130 foot trench by hand. Me and all my kids and my husband. My point to that is while we're digging and we dig at night and so, you know, the soil didn't look that bad. But in the morning when I'd come in and see what we had brought up. So now I'm like, ugh, oh my good. And then my son was helping cover stuff in and he was just kind of, you know, shoveling. And I was like, my good soil, put the gross stuff back in and leave my good. He was like, what, what do you mean? What does it matter? What does it matter? Seven years I've been working on this. So I could just even tell by the visual look how much better it has come, okay? Yes? Turkey the same way? They say that Whenever. turkey is um, kind of the lowest in the salts and the able, it won't burn your plants, the le it'll burn your plants the least. So um, I would use turkey, yeah. But here's what I do. Um, I put them all, so I, my chickens are kind of just free range and then they roost at night in this big, it's actually an open horse shelter. But so once a year, I, we dig out all the manure. So by then it's fairly composted, but we only do that in the fall and then I wait until spring to plant. So that's kind of my way of then nothing burns and it's fine. But if not, whatever manure you're gonna use for sure, you'd have to mix it in a pretty, like a almost a one to four ratio or else you'll have plants that are burning. I think cow and horse are really rich, yeah. So it'd be like you'd need to do a one to four part and really, really mix it before you should. But I used to do that and it was okay, you know. But I don't till any, oh, I keep touching that, I'm sorry. I don't till anymore. That's a different discussion, we'll have to have a different day. But so that's my way of, I'm not tilling, I just put it, leave it for the winter and then plant. But yeah, you do have to be careful. And even if you go to the, um, you should know about the compost places. Does Box Elder has one too, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a compost pile too, not just the wood chips, right? Okay, so Weber has one, Davis has one. Where the green waste places, their compost is usually really good too. Just you'd have to mix it in or do it in the fall and then let it sit for the winter. I mean, I feel like they break down and add nutrients, but they're slow to break down here. So that's the one thing about composting in Utah. It's so dry and our air is so dry that it's kind of a long process. Still an awesome process and you still should do it, but there are ways to make it faster, like adding, um, making sure that you add your own dirt to, because that's where the microorganisms are, right? And like, or even the kitchen compost bins, and you can kind of get this little starter thing. It's basically just the decomposers, right? Or a lot of people are really starting to get into the vermiculture, the worms, because they break down in seriously, like it's not even half the time. It's like a third of the time or maybe even less. Um, otherwise, I feel like banana pills sit there for a while, you know? So, yeah, but it's still good. You know, you're still mixing it all in. I love my chickens for my composters because I feed them all my scraps and then once a year we get the manure. Like that's just a good combo for me. And it, they've already done the work and it's beautiful by the time, well, you know, it's really rotten and gross and I have to pay my kids and I don't pay my kids for anything, but I pay them for that. <laughs> but once a year we do it and you know, we survive. So, um, but yeah, do any, do any of you compost? Only a botanist would say that we are botanists. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know what it will do to my soil is beautiful. I should say that. Okay. So normally I would pass these around, but we're just going to, I'm just going to show you it. Okay. So this is called the vegetable gardener's Bible by Edward Smith. Okay. And what I love about this is he really talks about, um, your soil and having kind of bigger rows, the raised beds. So if you're interested in 
kind of a different system maybe than you've done before. You should check this out. I like it. So he, this is his, his system. He calls it the word system. Wide rows, organic methods, raised beds, deep soil. So I, I think this is kind of cool. Um, I was already doing this before I got this book and then I was like, oh, look, I'm so smart. Or there's other people that think like me. But, and you guys don't have to do everything organically, right? It's a choice you get to make. To me, it's not worth how much work it is if I'm not gonna do it organically. It's just not, I could go to the store like a normal person. So, and not that I don't go to the store, but more often. Um, and so, so that's just a, you know, a choice you can make. But for me, I think I want it to be organic because why else am I doing all this work? And so that's why, you know, chicken manure and these things are my friends and it makes it work and it's awesome. Now we're gonna talk about seeds, okay? So for seeds, Okay, I always bring my ratty seed container because I like you to see that it doesn't have to be fancy. And my pu a puppy like 13 years ago chewed on it and there it still is, okay? So what matters is this, cool and dry to store them, okay? That's what matters. So it doesn't really matter what you have them in, how you keep them, but cool and dry matters. So here's what I like to show. If you think of it like this, then I feel like you're successful. A seed is a baby plant and it's lunchbox. That's seriously what it is. And yes, I teach that to second graders, but it applies to all of us. So, so think of a baby plant and it's lunchbox that of course I have to store it. It's alive, like it's in a kind of a hibernation mode, but I have to be careful with it, right? I can't like leave it where it's gonna fluctuate hugely in temperatures. Um, sometimes people say to, freeze your seeds and I totally wouldn't freeze my babies so I do not freeze seeds. I have put them in a fridge before if you had a spare fridge um, and that's been okay. I don't feel like it really lengthens out its life at all so but keeping it cool and dry will. Okay so here's here's what you need to know and I know you guys have all planted seeds and I know you've all had a seed packet before but what I don't know is if you knew what all these things meant or if you paid attention to this. So always on the back I wish that I could pass it to you, but there'll always be a stamp that says when it's packed for, okay? And seed companies take this very seriously. They'll bring seeds to Willard Bay Gardens in the spring when it's time. And like before winter comes, like probably fallish, maybe even a little late summerish, I don't know. They're gonna come gather them all up and then they store them and they repackage them and they retest them. Okay, so, so it's not, so if you're buying seed, you can be sure that it's good quality seed. Um, okay, so this one's packed for 2017. Okay, so we're in 2020, so I've got to keep that in mind. Most seeds have five to seven years that they are viable at the germination rate that they're listed for. So sometimes not right on the packet. Let me see if some do. No, they'll always have their lot number. Okay, so... Um, you can always look at the company that made them and then here's the lot. Then you can look on their website and they will tell you the percentage of germination if that mattered to you. The important thing to know is this. The germination rate is good for those first few years. And then after that, it doesn't mean like my mother-in-law, my father-in-law always buys seed for like the whole world, you know? So every, I don't know, five-ish years, I go see what he has because he'll have so many. I'll just know that I'm not gonna get as good of germination if they're older. But I've even planted seeds that are 10 years old and been okay. Maybe I only get 50%, but that's still okay, right? If they've been stored right. So um, these I just barely got from my mother-in-law that she had at her house. They were packed for 2013. So we're on the end of that. I kind of need to get them planted if, if we're going to, okay? I'm going to keep using this lettuce. This one is, it's called like red something. Oh boy. I don't know. Willard Bay sells it because I got it here. So red something mix. Okay. Um, I love this lettuce, but I love a lot of lettuce. And a lot of times people say to me, I don't have any success with lettuce. I can't get it to grow. So here's what you need to look at the back of your packet with. The seed depth is the most important piece of information on there. So this says, one eighth of an inch. That is like tiny, right? 
So if you're just going along with your tool, like you can't cover a seed an eighth of an inch with a tool, I'm here to say. You gotta use your hand. Okay, so we literally like do almost like a sprinkle and then kind of pat. And I have great success with lettuce and carrots, all those tiny, tiny seeds. So most people plant things too deep, okay? Most people plant their trees too deep too. Um, so just kind of be aware of that because that's probably the most, the key thing from keeping you, your seeds from germinating, okay? And then otherwise, yes? Okay, if you're ready to talk about that, let's do it. Uh oh. I don't know if I can hold this and this. I'll try. I'm not that skilled. Is this better? Ooh, I feel like I should sing a song. <laughs> what? I know, but then I have to hold still, and I'm not a holder stiller. Did you have another question though? No, no. no. okay. Okay, so from Utah State um, for Utah, this is what's so cool about information that you can get just right here. All the stuff on the internet, I know this is shocking, but it's not gonna be true in Utah. I know that's shocking to you. There are not truths on there, but especially when it comes to gardening, like they don't know what it's like in Utah. They never have good information unless it's coming from a source meant for us, okay? So these vegetable planting charts, is it okay if I just hand them and you guys pass them around? Okay, I don't know how stressed out you're feeling. Just wash your hands when you leave. Um, they are made for here. So they are so accurate for here, okay? Honestly, I would believe nothing else but this because this is tried and true, okay? So if you go through there, um, it will tell you, the, just look on there and it'll give you the times, okay? Those times are accurate for here. So by now, you could have planted seriously almost everything. Here's the things you can't plant. This will, we'll just talk about the can't right now, okay? And it will be a can in two more weeks or so. But for right now, today, tomatoes and peppers are a no, okay? Um, pumpkins, squash, melons, those are the no's and any kind of derivative of a melon or a squash or pumpkin, okay? So, but literally everything else can be planted by now. So today, if you just need to go home and get started, you, you can, everything's good. So I'm also supposed to say, don't worry about buying your tomatoes and your peppers yet, because they're not ready and it's not time anyway. And let them take care, let the garden centers take care of them and not you. I promise you'll have a better product if you wait a couple more weeks than if you take them home and are kind of babysitting them, right? We're just not as good at it. This is the one that you can see your exact city. So we're just gonna say, I live in Pleasant View, so we're gonna say Ogden, but you guys can look at your own city. And then they have them like hardy, semi-hardy, tender, okay? So usually the last frost date right here, let's just say in Willard, is like May 8th, somewhere right around there, okay? So, you can decide if you want to risk it a little bit and go a little bit early. You could use hot caps or walls of water if you wanted, but if it's gonna be a hard frost, you probably would still lose them if you didn't you know, be pretty significant about how you were gonna cover them. So that's more specific to just our area. But what's cool about it is just the fact that now you know, right? All those things that you could start now, um, so what I already have up in my garden is, well, I'll tell you what I already have planted, not every single thing is up, but carrots and lettuce and spinach and Swiss chard and onions, peas, um, yeah, right there's good. Um, green beans, I planted those a little bit later because they're, I think, on the semi-hardy list, but I just started to have a couple coming up. I don't know, what else do you guys have planted or what else do you want to plant? Strawberries. Strawberries are perennial and totally hardy, so that, that's whenever you put them in is fine. Um, I've had some for years. I've moved them around a little, make sure you thin them out, right? But seriously, so many things you could have already started. And there's more things that I don't even grow, you know, parsnips and turnips and oh, radishes. I've got radishes in, I've got potatoes in. So a good, huge list, okay? Oh, corn you should still wait on. I didn't mention that. So just look at that very tender group, okay? 
um, and then look at your city. So Ogden says May 3rd, and you know, every year's a little bit different. That's kind of the average of the past however long. So take a look at that. Artichoke, definitely you'd wanna start with a transplant. So either you started inside, oh, and we need to talk about that. You started inside and plant it out or just buy a little plant. Um, they're small, and but they're really sweet and really good. I got a lot of them, so it was fun. You have too? I, I've done it for seeds. Okay, yeah, just inside and then planted them out. Just in the garden. I'm a survival of the fittest. And you had, and you had good success. I'm a survival of the fittest too. <laughs> to me, so let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, on your seed packet, when you look on there, it'll always say, you know, you can start inside and then transplant after frost or whatever, but use these charts to help you more. My thoughts are this, seed outside is so much easier to grow than me babysitting and transplanting back and forth and you know, I, that's just me. I don't know, I don't grow plants, plants well inside, I just don't. So I start very little inside and I just start it all outside and it's easier to me for you to just grow where you're planted when it's time than me grow them inside and then I have to hardy them off by going in and out for a few days and then like that's what their nurseries for that's my thoughts but this is my cousin Alicia over here she has a little greenhouse and she's like amazing at it and likes to do it the inside stuff to me is like way too much babysitting and they're wimpy and then they just annoy me so I'm I usually only plant everything right outside and then I come here and I buy tomatoes and peppers and plant them. Otherwise I grow everything from seed, except for if I do artichoke, usually I grab a plant of that too. Sometimes it's hard to find, so seeds would probably be a good route for that. Asparagus, so usually the best way to do that is just bare root. Um, nurseries will sell kind of little bundles of it, just like they would strawberries, and they're just bare root, and you can stick them in the ground. However, I did plant some from seed a few years back and they're s just slow enough that I s t I'm telling you they get weeded every year by my kids. Every year I'm like, did you, were you careful about the asparagus? Oh, oh, that's what that was every year. But this year I still had some more coming up. So they're pretty tough. They're still trying, um, but really slow from seed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not at a super fast rate, but yeah, they will. I know, because that will be faster. I know, I was going to say, I grew up with it on the ditch bank, yes. I need to do that too. Although, so I grew up out by Alicia, and my mom would like yell at people who would kind of be driving by slowly. <laughs> she would, yeah, she'd yell at them all, and I'm like, Mom, that's not your property. Stop it. But she had been watching it How for before you're going to be able to harvest. Um... I'd say by the second year you'll have small ones. Like mine are like so little and skinny right now that they're just cute. You, it'd be like one person to have like a two forks full, you know. So, but so so probably the third year, you know, kind of with most fruit, second and third year I would say. Okay, so otherwise seeds are your friend. Seeds are cheap. Like seriously, I usually spend. I told you how big my garden was, right? I usually spend maybe $30 on seed and maybe 20 to 25 if on tomatoes and peppers. And if I buy like an eggplant or something, just a one or two of us, you know. Other, so like you can get a lot of seeds for the same price. Now I haven't done any official studies. However, my best estimation, so I spend that about $60 in the spring, okay? And then of course, we grow it all summer, and then we can it and freeze it and dry it and eat it, of course, and whatever else we can possibly think of. We give tons away to my in-laws, um, neighbors. I estimate we at least get 500 to $600 worth of produce out of 50 or $60 worth of seeds and plants, right? So you really can get a lot, um, but a lot of work, right? Let's be honest. It's a lot of work. So you have to feel passionate about either the nutrients you're going to get or growing your own food and knowing how it's been taken care of and handled. Um, or some of you just really love to do it. I love plants 
but I will never say that vegetable gardening is my very favorite because it's the most work, but I love all the food out of it. So that I, but, but I feel, and maybe you guys do too, cause you're here. I feel like it's just in me. Like we're humans, we eat food. So therefore we should grow food. Like it's just in me. And I don't know why the whole rest of the world doesn't feel that way. I think it's weird, but, um, but that's just the reason that I do it. It's just in me. We're humans and we eat. So therefore we should grow our food. But I, so I kind of, that is the one thing I'm enjoying about the world situation right now. I feel like it's helping people remember and kind of reprioritize. Oh, well look, we, we have time. Maybe we could grow some of our own food or maybe it'd be nice to have some on hand. So I kind of like that part of this whole thing. That's probably the only thing, but okay. So if you go, if you go on USU Extension's website, um, they have the best extension service, okay? And so their site and their information is great. If you go on there and it's usuextension.edu, yeah, isn't that right? Okay. You can, down the right side will be like homes, home and garden, um, lawns, fruit, okay? And you can go through and click very specific information for our area about any different thing that you want to grow. So it's a really useful tool. Um, it also has, and we can email these because it was kind of a lot of sheets. Um, but it also has a really good recommended vegetable varieties list. And again, it's for Utah. And so this is like invaluable for you guys. If you had, were new to gardening or hadn't had any luck with a certain type and you really wanted to try something, this would be the list I would choose from. So it's like green beans, okay? And then they list Blue Lake, Derby, Jade, Slenderette, and Strike. So those are kind of six varieties that they've tested here in Utah and that they can say do well. So I love that just for the sense of if you felt like you were new or you know really wanted to have success and hadn't in the past you could look at that and have better success i've tried most of the varieties on there um, and they're all they're all great most of them are the ones that i use so um but we'll email you that they have your address because you signed up for it so we can email the pdf okay and then she said that they'd post it on the website as well so you can see the varieties Okay, we wanna look at a couple other books. We're okay on time. Um, for just a minute, let's talk about seeds. So you can only save seeds if they're heirloom type seeds, okay? And what that means, okay, so look right here. Here's some corn, right at the top says hybrid, okay? Um, most corn is gonna be a hybrid. There are advantages to modern things. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not ever gonna deny that. They'll often be less, more disease resistant or less susceptible to something that's a normal problem. Okay, so there are advantages. But if I were to grow this candy corn, corn, and then in the fall decide I'm gonna dry out and save my seeds off of here, I will get something corn-like, but not this, okay? So if I wanna save my seeds, which given the current situation would probably be a good idea. I mean, I don't know how the seed situation is gonna be. You have to find some that say heirloom at the top or heirloom somewhere on them, okay? Heirloom just means that it is a variety, um, usually old, been around a long time, but is hasn't been altered by humans and you can save those seeds and get the exact same thing out of it, okay? So that's what heirloom means. Um, I like this book called The Heirloom Life Gardener. It's kind of about a couple that grows a bunch of food, but um, it talks a lot about saving seeds and kind of just living a little bit more sustainably. <clears throat> and then I also like, this one is called Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. And this one just goes, this would kind of be for someone who's a little bit more serious about saving their seeds, okay? Because it will go through details um, for any particular type, you know, if it's like cucumbers, what's the best way? I mean, some, some are so easy to save, like melons, cucumbers. You literally just kind of lay them out on your 
paper towel and let them dry and then store them cool and dry, right? But some things like tomatoes, you kind of have to let them ferment a little. It's a little more detailed. Um, still cool that you could save your own seed and have, have those same things for the next year. Um, I usually do for the easy stuff. Like here's some watermelon that my son saved last year. Um, so again, if it's an heirloom, you can, okay? And that was pretty simple. And then just put them in a little bag, label them. Um, sometimes you can go to seed swaps. Let's see if I have one. Oh, here's one. So every year in February, I think it's just called the Ogden Seed Exchange. They, then they only post on their Facebook page. Um, so you just have to search for it there, but they do a, a seed swap. Has to be local stuff. Like they don't let any, you know, bigger companies come in. And so it has to just be like a person that saves some seeds. Then you go there. Um, you don't have to swap them. You can bring money and buy them. So this is um, a winter squash, just in a cute little bag that I got at the seed swap. So same thing, I'll store it the same way, but I know that they used, you know, an heirloom variety and um, I can regrow that same seed. Will it always say on the tag, if you buy the plant, will it say heirloom? Sometimes it will, but it doesn't always, right? Okay, um, but what you could do is, it should say the variety name and you could just look that up, you know. Um, pumpkin and squash are sometimes the harder ones, so. I don't know. You've all had like a volunteer squashish thing come up in your garden. What is that? <laughs> I mean, it's like pumpkin like and yeah, kind of zucchini ish, but all in one. Yeah, that's what happens. Okay, so let's see. Let's talk for just a second about um, herbs. If any of you like to grow herbs, they are also really do really well here, most of them, okay? Um, Some are annuals, so basil cilantro what are their annuals dill you would just need to plant them every year i have great success just even from seed okay i'm just right in my vegetable garden for those kinds because i'm going to be planting the other stuff and i just let it get watered the same and everything's good cilantro in utah it's not the greatest mix but just get hot and it just goes to seed fast I mean like in two weeks. So here's here's the thing. If you use a lot of cilantro and you like to use it and it, you like to grow it, just know that you have to do every two weeks planting. So just have a small amount that you feel like you'll be able to, it'll get ready, you cut it, you use it, and then you're done with it basically. And then the next batch, if you planted it two weeks later, will be ready, you cut it, you use it. Just real quick turnover, okay? Whereas a lot of other things, you know, basil you could cut and reuse, cut and reuse the whole season, right? So cilantro is kind of a problem child, but we still do it. Okay, um, I don't think I have any other herb seeds in here, but the rest of the herbs are perennials here and do great in Utah. So thyme and lavender and sage and oregano and what else? Rosemary is a perennial by its life cycle, but often doesn't make it through our freeze thaw in about February. Um, so sometimes I just treat it like an annual. I just buy one and have it, and sometimes it'll make it that winter, but not the next, you know? So I guess treat it like a tender perennial that you may have to replace, okay? Um, what other herbs do you guys like or use? Tarragon. tarragon? I haven't ever grown tarragon, have you? Just as a annual? That's a perennial. Okay, cool. Parsley. Oh, yeah. So parsley is a biennial. Its sole purpose is to produce seed. So it's going to be woody and start to flower as fast as it can, and it just doesn't taste the same. So just use it as an annual, but it does grow. It can be fairly aggressive. Okay. So I have a golden oregano that is very well made. Kit. Then I have regular Italian oregano that every year I dig tons of it out, give it away, and I still have more than plenty. So, and it's not like so crazy that I can't believe I ever planted it. No, it's not like that, but just be on your toes a little bit, okay? Or maybe even put them somewhere by 
your sidewalk or something that's kind of trapped, you know. But mint is a whole different game. So I won't plant mint, and I wouldn't recommend planting mint unless it's just in a pot. It is a crazy, crazy aggressive. It'll take over everything. Just think of it kind of like grass, like a naughty grass. It's pretty aggressive. Be careful with mint, okay? <laughs> it's like coronavirus. That is a good analogy. Oh, awesome. Yes, those are great here. Um, I do, so I plant onions two ways. I plant them by seed and I use them just as my green onions, okay? I just plant them. They're hard to get far apart because they're tiny, so I just sprinkle them through. They come up, then I'll just use those like green onions. But then I plant the sets, which is that little baby bulb you can buy, right? I plant those and I space them out and let those become the nice big bulb onions that then I'll save for the winter. So both ways work. You could plant your seed and space them out like you should, but that's my version of green onions. So, okay. Oh, and we didn't talk about chives as a perennial or as an herb and a perennial. Um, the regular chives is a good perennial, does well here. Garlic chives as well. It reseeds really easily, so I kind of have to babysit just a little and be like, no, not there, and you can be here. But it's not too bad. So garlic chives is fun, and that's fun when in the winter when I, well, not like the dead of winter, but later in the fall and earlier in the spring than um, my onions would be doing it much. I can always go get some garlic chives still, and I'll just use them in place of it. So that's an easy way. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, ignore that part. Like a normal person's. I would say the spacing of the plants matters more than anything else. So if so, if it's green beans, you know, and the spacing says six inches, then go with that. If it's um, you know, lettuce, we really just kind of sprinkle our lettuce. Yeah. Look, they say 12 inches apart. Yeah, we don't do that. But it's hard to plant lettuce 12 inches apart. Like they're little. So we just kind of sprinkle and they're closer. And we'll just cut and let it grow, cut and let it grow several times until it kind of starts to get too hot and too bitter and gross because it's hot. And then, um, but I've done them at different times. So then I'll have another batch ready. Does that make sense? Um, I also grow a ton and just feed them to my chickens because then that's less food that I have to buy for them. So. Normal people should only plant one zucchini. Everyone knows this, right? One zucchini. <laughs> one, just one. Uh-huh. But, but here's why. I, this is my theory anyway. I have a 1950s zucchini pamphlet that my mom had, so I've copied it. Um, and it, you know, every kind of way to use zucchini, some that you really wouldn't want to. Lots are really pretty good. But what other vegetable-y type, I mean technically it's a fruit, but what other vegetable-y type thing have we found ways to put in every like dessert and sweet bread, like none. We don't do that normally. I mean I guess we put carrot in a cake, but otherwise like that's just a different domain. But it's because they're so prolific we have to find ways to use them, right? But the cool thing about this book, um, you know how they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away? Well zucchini if you pound for pound compare the nutrients and the vitamins it's like four and five and ten times depending on which vitamin what an apple has so i the, my theory is they're so good for us we have to eat a ton of them and we have to put them in weird things that we wouldn't normally you know why is there something green in my brownie but um but that's why because they're so good for us and they're so prolific so normal people plant one i plant like 10 because my chickens love them and it's just an easy, fast way for me to have a bunch of food for them. So, okay, I want to show you two more books. Um, this one is so fun. If you love tomatoes, it has the funnest pictures. It's called Epic Tomatoes. <clears throat> so it goes through and gives you a ton of great ideas, but at the back, it goes through varieties and then has pictures and details about each variety. Um, and I thought I had grown a lot of tomatoes in my life. And I, I mean, I probably have compared to a lot of people, but once I got this, I was like, oh my goodness, there are so many cool tomatoes. So what's fun about tomatoes, um, the heirloom type are the only ones that you would be able to save seed for, right? 
that there's still a good variety of those. And some of them have the yummiest flavor, but I also am always reminded why there are modern tomatoes. Like, I love the heirloom ones, I love their flavor, but the things that they do that are kind of annoying compared to the modern ones, like the splitting from the sun and the black spot on the bottom, it's called blossom end rot, like those are all kind of problems of tomatoes and why modern ones were developed, right? Um, or even the sprawliness of the plant compared to some of the modern ones, they're so nice and compact. So maybe have some of both, you know, depending on what, what you like to do. Um, a certain that I like? Oh, I like them all. Um, I like, let's see. Well, you know how, so I'm a little bit of a food snob because I grow so much, right? So like I won't even pick for us to eat a zucchini that's past, I mean, seriously, because my chickens can eat it all, so I'm not wasting it, right? I kind of feel the same way. I don't even buy, you guys will think I'm so funny. I grow them, I can them, I dry them, like I make juice and all that, okay? Spaghetti sauce, blah, blah. I do not buy tomatoes. So from November till July, I have no tomatoes to eat fresh because I'm a snob. Those aren't, I don't know what those are, but they're not tomatoes to me. They don't taste like a tomato. They're an imposter. I can't do it. If I'm at a restaurant and there's a tomato on, so, you know, I would eat it, but I don't buy them. I'm not wasting my money. So I will only can with Roma tomatoes because it's just not worth my efforts. Otherwise to cook sauce down for seven hours because it's so runny is dumb to me. I can use Roma. The heirloom one is called La Roma. But for eating, I would eat any tomato. My favorite for fresh eating are the yellow ones, the Golden Boy. Um, what are some of the other yellow names? Do you like those too? <laughs> She's licking her lips. Um, so those are my favorite just for eating, but I like all tomatoes. Um, Cherokee Purple is an heirloom one that is really kind of fun because it's kind of a dark purplish, almost brown. But if you want to try a really weird one, you should try Green Zebra because that one's kind of fun. And Willard Bay will always have a lot of cool varieties that are you don't see other places. But I mean, just traditional celebrity and early girl, those are fine too, you know? I, always, I usually plant one early girl just because then it's earliest, you know? It's nice to have one early. Um, but I just won't can unless they're Romas. But I won't can with peaches unless they're Albertas, so I'm kind of a snob. Okay, one more book. Um, this one is about companion plants. This is, it's called Carrots Love Tomatoes. And it's just Louise Riot, I guess is how you say her name, or Riotti. But it's kind of just some of those combinations for plants that do well together, help each other generally is why, you know, it might be um, the onions deter the insects that commonly come around whatever plant. So it's some good tips. Um, some people are really into this and really do a lot of it. I like to use it for space ideas. So um, last year, you know how there's early stuff and then it kind of gets done. Then you have later stuff that you needed space for. So the best combination that I've come up with for space, um, last year I just put like my radishes with, and then I planted my cucumbers. So while the cucumbers were tiny and doing barely anything, then the radishes could take up the space. And I think I put some peas in there too, but, um, and then by the time those were done and out, then the cucumbers could spread. So sometimes it's more of a space thing than anything else. Um, this year I'm, my main insect that I battle with is the squash bug. Um, I don't know if you know what those are or not, but they will kill your squash pretty easily. Usually we just do the physical removal. So once a week, I have three boys. So to go out, search for eggs on the underside of the leaves and to smash bugs, like that's a great thing for them, right? Sometimes they complain still because you know, the leaves are pokey and there's too many, and it's too hot, whatever. But that's our best method. So we find the eggs, we take off that whole entire leaf, we feed it to the chickens. And then if we, any adults we find, we just, I just let them smash them because that works. Um, but last year I used peppermint oil 
just all around that bed and it really helped. Um, but I also, um, a lady in one of my classes had had really good luck with growing nasturtiums around them. So this year I'm growing nasturtiums so that I can not have squash bugs. So sometimes companion planting can be something as simple as that, you know, trying to keep away the insects that bug you. Let's just do like maybe two more questions if you have any. Yes. Brussels sprouts. I have grown those. Um, this is what all the cabbage family, broccoli, cauliflower, all those are a little bit hard. They're very susceptible to aphids. So that's kind of hard. But it, so if you just kind of stay up on that and maybe do like a soap and water treatment regularly to stay on top of the aphids, because once they're getting an infestation and I never have aphid problems anywhere, but I always do if I plant those. I do usually plant um, cabbage still every year. And this year I have cauliflower starts starting as well. Sometimes when they're getting older, you'll get the little cabbage moths and the caterpillars so that then when you take your broccoli in to cook it, you have your green floating friends. That's fun. And you just don't tell your kids, but you can't really eat it. And then think about too, Brussels sprouts are a flower bud, right? And so it's gonna open and go to flower. So you gotta kind of like watch closely for when that harvest time will be. So you don't let it go too long. So has anyone else done Brussels sprouts? They're doable here, they work here. It's just sometimes the pests are annoying to me and then I get wimpy. You could put a net thing on it to take care of the cabbage moth, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad that you're gonna grow vegetable gardens and um, we'll put those handouts, we'll get them to you so that you can have the varieties that are available, okay? But otherwise, go home and plant. You can plant everything but those few tender things we talked about, so. Okay, thanks for coming.